everyone. Welcome to Shelter Rock Church Online. My name is Leslie Stoltz and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Thank you for checking in to Shelter Rock Church this morning. Now, if you're new here, we would love to get to know you. It helps us become familiar with, with those of you who maybe are joining us for the first time. It's also a great way to get connected to all that's going on in the church family. Now, there's a few ways you can do that. You can click on the connect card link that's in our bio. You can also download the Shelter Rock Church app and then click, uh, click connect card or simply fill out it online by going to shelterrockchurch.com backslash connect card. We would love to hear from you in either of those ways. Well, again, Happy New Year to all of you who are watching. You know, with the beginning of 2024, I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, old habits that we hope to drop and several new ones that we hope to uh, incorporate into our lives. We would love to know what are some of your New Year's resolutions. You can drop those in the chat. Uh, but walking around the stores in January, I've learned a few things of what our intentions are for this time of year. Uh, there's an obsession with storage bins and exercise equipment, which are uh, necessary tools for keeping all these New Year's resolutions. Everyone seems to be looking for, in a sense, a restart button and to become uh, more organized and fit and a healthier person in the new year. Now, I have a resolution that hopefully is going to challenge me as well. I hope sure to improve new health habits but mostly I'm determined to increase in my faith. In the book of Mark, uh, two verses in chapter five and then chapter six uh, jump out at me. In Mark chapter five, Jesus is approached by Jairus, who's a, a religious leader to heal his sick daughter. And before doing so, this woman uh, received healing from Jesus. Uh, the interaction uh, deterred Jesus from getting to Jairus's daughter in time. And the girl, uh, she passed away. Jesus then told Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, simple. Jesus told the man to stop relying on himself and what humans could accomplish, but rather Jairus needed to place his fear and uncertainty in the hands of Jesus. Now, jump forward to Mark chapter six, and Jesus was in his own hometown and in the ministry of Jesus, it says it was limited because of their lack of faith. You see, the absence of faith prevented full access to the power of Jesus. And in both of these accounts, it reminds me of the need for increased faith. The uncertainties of life, they tempt me to lean on my own ability and cause my, my faith to decrease because I focus on what I can humanly accomplish. And so my challenge this year is to look to God through all the variables of life. I, I don't want my lack of faith to prevent seeing all that Jesus can do in my life and in the life of our church community as well. So would you commit to praying with me, worrying less, and celebrating all that God's going to do in 2024? Isaiah uh, writes in encouragement to the people of God in, in chapter 40 and in verse 28, he says, do you not know, have you not heard? He's causing us to bring our eyes upward. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagle. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's bring our hearts and our minds and our eyes to the one who gives us strength, and let's worship him now. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. I pray a blessing over everyone over the screen and in this room, Lord. I just pray that you give us peace and humble our weak, Lord. And I just pray a blessing over each and every person listening, Lord. I pray that you would just have a discernment over us all week, Lord, and that you would just show us your light all the day long, Lord. And I just pray in Jesus' name, amen. Praise when I'm short and praise 
And if it puts me in the fire, I rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be Thanks for worshiping with us. My hope and prayer is that we sense God's presence near to us uh, as we start this year, as we focus our attention on him. At Shelter Rock Church, we believe that the act of, of giving is itself an act of worship. And so we give to God as he has so freely given to us. And, and we wanna thank uh, all of those who have faithfully given to God through Shelter Rock Church. And thank you for participating in what God is doing in and through our church. And so if you would uh, love to give today, you can do so using the link in our bio or through uh, our church app. But again, we wanna say thank you in advance for giving to God uh, and partnering with us. Well, here's Pastor Henry now, who's uh, kicking off a new series entitled, Let the Church Be the Church, and the message today is titled, Salt. Would you please join me in reading of God's word? Uh, uh, today, the scripture comes from Matthew chapter 5 uh, and verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. This is the word of the Lord.
Well, good morning, Shelter Rock Church family, and Happy New Year to each and every one of you. It's good to be with you today on this first Sunday of 2024. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Henry, and I'm one of our pastors on staff, and it really is a privilege to be with you today. And if you're new to our church, you may be wondering what's happening this morning with the Sunday sermon. I just want to take a moment and assure you that on just about every Sunday of the year, there will be a live preacher in the room you're in. And if you come back next week or the week after, one of our flesh and blood preachers will be there delivering the Sunday sermon. But as we've done on the first Sunday of the year for the past several years, and as we do from time to time, whether for casting vision or for fostering unity or because we're covering like a very difficult uh, or sensitive topic in the text, sometimes we'll leverage technology to bring our entire church under one text and one teaching at one time. And being the very first Sunday of the year, we set aside this Sunday. It's, uh, it's what we call our Vision Sunday, uh, where we have a chance not so much to hear me share my vision for our church, but where together we all get to hear God and listen to Jesus and hear what is Christ's vision for his church. Amen? Yeah, so, so whether you're in Manhasset or Syosset or Westbury or online, I want to welcome you all today as we begin a new year and a new sermon series. We're calling it Let the Church be the church. And our hope, our prayer, is that this series will start to build a foundation and be a framework for how you and I can be the church that God has always called us to be. And this is an important year to, to talk about this because this year is an election year. Did you know that? 2024 is an election year. Just like brace yourself. Because in an election year, we know everybody seems to go crazy. And it's important for us as the church to remember what does it mean to be the church. To remember that the church is distinct from and should never be confused or conflated with any nation, state, political party, or system, or government. To remember that our identity and our allegiance is to Jesus Christ first and foremost and his kingdom above any national identity. To remember that our primary message is to bring good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the coming of his kingdom, and not to preach the, the good news of any particular politician or political party. As we move through this year, you and I, we're going to remind one another that we are ambassadors, that we are witnesses to God's kingdom. And we must resist the temptation to, to both withdraw from the world and conform to the world. Rather, we are to maintain our distinct presence, our prophetic witness as the people of God, his body, his bride, his temple, his citizens, his flock, his family. As the world goes crazy, as the government does what it does, I say let the people be the people, let the government be the government, but let the church be the church. But what is the church? What is the church called to be? What is Jesus' vision for his church? And to explore that today, I want to look at um, the first of a series of metaphors that we see in the New Testament that describe the nature and purpose and calling of the church, of every church in every age. Our text today is Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And it says this. Jesus is speaking. It's the Sermon on the Mount, and he says these words. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Would you bow with me in prayer? God, for a few moments, we ask that you would join us, that you would continue to be with us in our worship space, but that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to receive all that you want to say to us today. What is your vision for the church? What is it you want to do in us and through us? God, God, do this work for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus says in our text, you are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And I want to explore that together today. First, I want to show you an image. This is Holy Trinity Church in Boston. It's a beautiful, historic church. The foundation was laid in the 1800s, and as you can see, uh, the church has a Gothic-style feature that really stand out, like its steeple is 110 feet high. It was built to meet the needs of German immigrants who were moving into the predominantly Irish community in the south of Boston. And this church was a church, a thriving church for over 140 years. But if you go to the site and you visit this church today, you're going to see this church is no longer a church anymore. It's been shut down and sold off and converted into 33 luxury condos. Or how about, th about this beautiful church? This is Mount Vernon Congregational Church. This church was founded in 1842, uh, and its first pastor, a guy by the name of Edward Kirk, his preaching led to the conversion of a 15-year-old boy whose name was Dwight Lyman Moody. Now, if you know your history, your church history, you know that D.L. Moody is probably the most famous evangelist of the 19th century. He would preach to people, audiences of over 10 to 20,000 people in America and in Europe. And, you know, in Chicago, the Moody Bible Institute still trains pastors for ministry to this day. So you can trace all of that impact back to this church, Mount Vernon Church, which stood for 150 years. But today, if you visit this church, it's no longer a church anymore. It's been sold off. It, too, is now luxury condos. Or how about this one? This is Clarendon Street Baptist Church. Their founding pastor in 1869 was A.J. Gordon. His passion was to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ worldwide. And this church existed, and for 25 years uh, in their basement, they founded a, a missionary training institute. That training institute would eventually become Gordon College. The Divinity School would eventually become Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Uh, and yet again, if you visit this church today, you'll see that even though it was a church for 150 years, this church is not a church anymore. I'll let you just guess what it is now. And it's not just in cities in the U.S. like Boston and Chicago and Philly and D.C. and New York, but literally across the world, churches that were built to be a church are being shut down and sold off and then repurposed as something else. And what strikes me is that every time one of these churches were built, they had a particular vision, a particular purpose in mind, but none of these buildings are fulfilling their purpose today. How does that happen? How does that happen? How does a church which is alive and thriving and on mission with Jesus and for Jesus and advancing God's kingdom get to the point where it's no longer a church anymore? And think of it not just as the building, but think about the people. Think about the community of faith. Think about the body that is there, the salt and the light that is no longer present. How does that happen? How in the words of Jesus, is someone that is salt, no longer salty again. Right? This is what Jesus is saying. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. It's no longer good for anything except to become luxury condos for people to live in. See, see, Jesus is communicating to God's people and to us in very uh, simple language. He's using a very simple metaphor. He's talking about salt, right? He's taking something that is as ordinary as salt, but he talks about it in such a spiritually significant way. And he begins by saying, you are the salt of the earth. As we look at this text, I want you to first take notice that Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth first, he says you are the salt to Christians. He doesn't say you ought to be the salt or you should be salt. He says, no, no, right now you are the salt. And he tells his disciples who they are long before in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells them anything to do. Now this is really, really important. You get the indicative of who you are before you get the imperative and the command of what you are to do. Jesus first gives his disciples and us a new identity before he tells us then how to live in light of this new identity. And this is how grace works. He tells us who we are first, and then he tells us to be who we are. 
right? For Christians, our ethic, the Christian ethic, is to become who you are. In Greek or in Confucianism um, philosophy, it, it is become who you should be. But for Christians, it is become who you already are. Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. And he uses this metaphor of salt. Salt is something that we know. It preserves, um, it, it, it protects, um, it, it, it flavors, right? It does all of these other things. But how might Jesus' first hearers heard this statement? Now, years ago, I was walking through a bookstore. I think it was called a book review in Huntington. It's not there anymore, but I came across this book. And it grabbed my attention because it's called Salt, A World History. And, and, I, and I picked it up and I decided to read it um, because, you know, I like to fill my mind with useless knowledge, like a world history, a whole book just on salt. I was like, I can't resist it. So, I read the book and then this week I remembered that I owned it and I looked through it again. And it's no longer useless knowledge, it's, it's useful knowledge because I get to share with you the significance of salt in the ancient world. We don't think about it today, but actually salt is one of the most sought after commodities in human history. The use of salt, salt uh, dates all the way back to prehistoric times with the, uh, the evidence of salt production in ancient civilizations in China, in Egypt, in Rome. Uh, it was used as a, as a preservative, but also for seasoning for food. But because it was used as a preservative, it would allow food to store and last for longer periods, right? They didn't have refrigeration. What they had was salt, and salt was valuable in the ancient world. Salt was so valuable. In fact, here is some salt that is right from the Dead Sea. Uh, the salt concentration is so long, you can go into the Dead Sea and pick out salt crystals, and here are salt crystals on top. Salt was so important in the ancient world that it actually led to the establishment of trade routes in every ancient civilization. Um, it, it, it was something that secured finances, it secured empires, it inspired revolutions. Salt actually brought nation to war against nation. In the ancient world, salt was used as payment. It's where we get the word salary. It's, it comes from a Latin word. And in fact, in Roman times, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. The value of salt was so high that in some cultures, it was used as a form of currency. Like in Ghana, they would trade salt for gold. Wouldn't you love it if you could make a trade like that today? But back in the day, this is what they did. They would trade salt for gold, and it led to a trade route in the Saharan Desert. The ancient Egyptians used salt to make mummies. The ancient Greeks believed that salt was a sacred mineral. They used it in um, offerings and services and sacrifices and festivals. Uh, in France, the salt tax was such a major source of revenue, the tax was so high that actually it led to a rebellion over the salt tax. That rebellion, we know it as the French Revolution. Homer, the great writer, called salt a divine substance. Plato described it as especially dear to the gods. This is how valuable, this is how essential salt was in the ancient world world. And it's not just valuable for industry, it's valuable to our bodies. You know, chloride is essential for digestion and respiration. Without sodium, the body, uh, which the body cannot manufacture itself, the body would be unable to transport nutrients of oxygen, to transmit nerve impulses, to move muscles, including the heart. Every single one of us, adult human beings today, we contain about 250 grams of salt in our bodies. That's about like three or four salt shakers. And it's essential to replace this lost salt to survive. Salt is essential to life. Salt is valuable. Salt is precious. In the ancient world, salt was one of the most valuable commodities anyone could ever imagine. All of this is wrapped up when Jesus says to his disciples and to you and to me and everyone who's a follower of Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. You, you have immense value. You are vital and you are essential to life on this planet. Everything there, everything I've said and so much more. By the way, if you wanna read the book, just email me, I'll tell you the title. You can learn more about the impact of salt, but it's so profound to think about the impact of salt, the significance of salt, how essential it is for the flourishing of humanity, for the flourishing of the human civilization, for the preservation of the world. You are the salt 
of the earth. But then Jesus says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Now, this is a confusing phrase because we tend to think of salt as like table salt, uh, pure salt, N-A-C-L. Salt can't lose its saltiness. But in the ancient world, um, they would collect salt, like from the Dead Sea, for example, let's say. They would gather all of these minerals and there would be salt, but it would be mixed in with like other chlorides like um, magnesium and potassium and uh, calcium and, and, and other things. And so what happened is they would create a salt pile by the side of their house and mixed in was pure NaCl. But what happened was in, in, in times of high moisture or during flooding or during rains, uh, the sodium chloride, the NaCl salt, being the most soluble in water would dissolve and wash away. So you'd have this salt pile, but then the rains would come and the floods would come and it would wash away the pure salt, the thing that is salty, the thing that preserves, the thing that flavors, and it would leave something that looks like salt, but was not salty at all. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, church, if, if you're not careful, you're going you're to look like salt on the outside, but you won't make any difference on the inside. It won't, it won't really be the real thing. It'll be an empty shell. You know, a bunch of condos that look like a church. And he doesn't want that for us. He says instead, I want you to be the salt of the earth. In fact, you are the salt of the earth. And by saying that, Jesus is saying at least three things. First of all, he's saying we are a distinct presence. We are a distinct presence on this earth. Secondly, salt was a preservative. He's saying we are a preserving presence. And lastly, we are a transforming presence. First, we are a distinct presence. Salt adds flavor. You can't add salt and not taste the salt is there. You get something bland like potato chips or uh, French fries and, and there's no salt on it. Like no one wants to eat it. But the moment you put some salt on it, you know it's there. Salt adds flavor. I like the way Pastor Nathan said it this week. He says, you know, Jesus is saying to the church, you are blessed and highly flavored. Right? This is the idea. Like you, you, you are this distinct, unique particular presence and when you're there your presence is felt your presence is seen your presence is heard your presence is known you stand out and we as God's people we are the salt of the earth we are to be distinct and unique and different from the things we come in contact with right this is what Leon Morris New Testament scholar says he says um, the main thing about salt is that it's different so it is with disciples. Their power in the world lies in their difference from it. I love that quote. And I love this one from Russell Moore. He says, um, a church that loses its distinctiveness is a church that has nothing distinctive with which to engage the culture. A worldly church is of no good to the world. We are distinct. We are different. We are a distinct presence. But secondly, we are a preserving presence. That's what it means to be the salt of the earth, is to be a preservative, right? Salt was the ancient equivalent of refrigeration. If you wanted to, to, to stop meat from spoiling or from decaying or from rotting, you would rub it in salt. Now, this was the main reason salt was so valuable, because it had the ability to preserve and to protect against decay. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying that we as disciples of Jesus, we are, we're sent in this world to prevent the world from decaying, to prevent the world from being corrupted or ruined, to be an agent in the world. Whether, whether we're at work, like in the sciences or education or in the business world or in the medical field, or whether we're at school or whether we're at home or in our neighborhood or in our sports teams, wherever we are to remember that if we are a Christian, we are different and we are there to be a preserving agent in that place. Which means salt doesn't just savor, it saves. It saves. It has a saving presence, a distinct presence a preserving presence, but also a transforming presence. We are a transforming presence. Jesus is saying you are a transforming presence. Notice he says you are the salt of the earth. 
You are the salt of the earth. The language is important. And many scholars believe the reason Jesus specifies earth is because he's talking to like people in a rural farming community and they would have understand the significance of how salt and the earth relate. Because in the ancient world, in Jesus' world, in the first century, in uh, Jewish Palestine, uh, they use salt as a fertilizer for soil. And depending on the conditions, it, it could mean like it would help like hold on to water. It would release minerals for plants. It would kill weeds. It would protect crops from disease. It would stimulate growth. It would increase yield. Salt was a fertilizer in the ancient world. And what Jesus is saying when he says, you are the salt of the earth, he's also saying like, as disciples of mine, you are meant to be fertilizers of the world that you're in. Like you and I are sent to enrich the soil to kill the weeds, to protect against disease, to stimulate growth, and as we scatter, to bring about fruitfulness in unexpected places, right? Streams in the desert, water in the wasteland. Isaiah says, the wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will be, will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Why? Because God's people are there. And when we're there, we are the salt of the earth. We are a distinct presence. We are a preserving presence. And we are a transforming presence. What is Christ's vision for his church? I think it's that we would be who we already are that we would be who he's made us to be, that we would become who Christ gave his life for us to be, that in the midst of a world where there's erosion of hope and peace, where there's anxiety, where there's turmoil, where there's division, where there's combat, where there's war, where there's violence, that we would be the salt of our earth, day after day, week after week, year after year. Let the church be the church. For we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are the bride of Christ. We are the family of God. Let's live like it. We are citizens of heaven first. We are strangers and sojourners and exiles. We know this world is not our home. Let us be who we already are. And on this Vision Sunday and through this election year, I say let the church be the church. Let the church in America no longer concern itself with creating a more moral America. Rather, let us use our voice to speak the truth that all morality is empty apart from Jesus. Let the church be the voice that speaks of God's kingdom as the only superpower that can truly solve the problems and pain in our world. Let us be the foremost advocates against poverty and racism and violence and war, knowing that all of this is only possible through Jesus Christ. Let us show what it really means to love one another and to love and care for one another and to love and care for our world because it's been entrusted to us. It doesn't belong to us. It's been entrusted to us. It belongs to God. Let us be like the prophets. Let us bear witness with our voices. Let us speak and let our voices be heard and yet not our voice, but the voice of God. Let his voice be heard for his sake, for his glory, and for our good. For you are, you are, you are, we are salt of the earth. Let's pray. Father. I pray that you would continue to keep us salty, distinct, uh, preservative agents, transforming agents, bringing about your peace, your flourishing, your shalom in the world. Father, we don't want to withdraw the world from the world. We know we could in any way, and we definitely don't want to assimilate into the world. We want to maintain our distinct identity this year and every year as your people and be faithful to you and to all you've called us to be. Do this work in us, among us, through us. Father, we give it to you. Holy Spirit, do what you do through Shelter Rock Church in 2024. We place all of us in your hands. We love you and we thank you in advance for what you're gonna do in our family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.
Well, thank you, Pastor Henry, for the message today. What a great reminder to all of us, for us to, to be the church, to be the church that, that God has called us to be, the people he has called us to be. Uh, and this challenge for us today, it's that we are the salt of the earth. I hope that was an encouragement for you as well. And as we come now to a time of communion, a reminder to all of us, all of God's people, that Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, he laid down his life for us. He, he died in order for us to, to be his own, to be his people. And so as you gather here at home or wherever you might be, uh, would you join me in, in receiving these uh, elements, these communion elements that are a reminder to us of the, the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, we are here, people grateful to you we thank you jesus that you lay down your life for your people for your sheep and then in turn father that you're calling us uh, to uh, to be your people to be your church to carry your good news of your gospel uh, into the world around us and so may we be the salt of the earth may we be people who are making a difference and bringing hope and healing to the world around us jesus thank you for your death, thank you for your life. Thank you that you promise to be with us and that you're coming back again. And so Jesus, we pray all of this in your name. Amen.
Well, again, we hope you felt encouraged today through the worship and the word of God. Uh, we want to be able to pray for you and what, uh, what you're facing in your life here today. And so I wanna invite you to submit a prayer request. You can do that using uh, the let us know how we can pray for you link in the video description. Again, thanks for joining us today on YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe and share our service uh, with your family and your friends. And we look forward to being together again next week. God bless.